Hi, thanks for joining me. My name is Mindy Mandel. In this video today, I'm going to be talking about Plotinus and specifically about his Ennead on the One or the Good. Before I get into the Ennead, though, I do want to say just a word or two about Plotinus. So he lived in the third century, so some 500 years or so after Plato, and he's generally known in academia as the father of Neoplatonism. So scholars generally want to separate Plato from Plotinus and those other philosophers in this tradition who come after him. Um, I think it's because of the more openly spiritual nature of these later Platonists of their writings. Um, of course, those of us who see Plato's work in a spiritual light don't necessarily make that distinction, and so I tend to just call them all Platonists. But you will see him referred to as the father of Neoplatonism because that era is marked, is beginning from Plotinus. So his writings, there are 54 essays. Um, according to his biography, his students asked him to please write something down as he got older in years, and so he wrote a bunch of essays. And then one of his students, a man named Porphyry, a philosopher in his own right, he organized these essays. So there are 54 of them, so he put them in six groups of nine. And the word Ennead is the Greek word for a group of nine. And so that's what these essays came to be known as. Now, the one I'm going to be talking about today is actually the very last one. It's from that sixth group of the six groups total. And it is the ninth essay in that group of nine. And so this one is called The Good or the One. And I chose this one in part because it is just one of the best. It's, it's really a beautiful, beautiful essay. But also because I think it fits well with what I've done in the last two videos covering the metaphysics. So this one is going to take it a step further. For Plotinus, it's not enough to just talk about metaphysics. You're not really doing philosophy if you're only talking about metaphysics. You're simply talking about philosophy. But what we want to do is actually do philosophy. And that means that we have to actually bring our soul to a healthier state. And that includes seeking the experience or the feeling the presence of the good or the one. And so this essay covers some metaphysics, but it also it's going to take it that step further into the experiential side of doing philosophy. Okay, that said, let's get into it. So the essay is broken up into 11 parts, and therefore I have organized this video in the same way. So Plotinus opens with some arguments that we've already seen, we saw two weeks ago, about the one being the condition for existence. And here's just one excerpt from that section. He says, if it's not a one, a thing is not. No army, no choir, no flock exists, except it be one. No house even or ship exists, except as a unit, house, or the unit ship. Their unity gone, the house is no longer a house. The ship is no longer a ship. Now, also in this first section, he makes the case that the soul is not the one. Now, he's going to go through the various metaphysical levels, first explaining why the soul can't be the one, and then he's going to look at the intelligence and being, or the intelligible, as we've been calling it in some other systems, in Plato's system. And then he's going to go on to talk about the one itself. Okay, so first, the soul is not the one. He says, the soul is manifold as well as one, even though it is not constituted as parts. So it has a certain unity to it. That's what he means by saying as well as one. It has a unity to it, but it's manifold. It has various faculties, discursive reason, desire, perception, joined together in unity is by a bond. Okay, so we see that the soul cannot be the one. And then in the second part, he goes on to argue that neither being nor the intelligence are the one. So first about being. As the being of each thing consists in multiplicity, and the one cannot be multiplicity, the one must differ from being. And because being possesses life and intelligence, it is not dead. It must be multiple. And then here's what he says of the intelligence that it is dual. Duality is implied if the intelligence, or nous, is both thinker and thought. It is not simple, therefore not the one. 
And if the intelligence contemplates some object other than itself, it would uh, contemplate something greater than itself. And so then certainly there exists something superior to the intelligence. He also says that we must conceive the intelligence as enjoying the presence of the good and the one. Now here, he's not saying the good and the one are two separate things. And you'll see that in the next few sentences here that he's, it's contemplating it, so singular. So the good and the one are two names for the same thing. It's enjoying the presence of that which we call by the two names, the good and the one. And contemplating it while it is also present to itself thinks itself, and thinks itself as being all things. Constituting such a diversity, the intelligence is far from being the one. So now that he has dismissed those lower realms as being the one, he can now go into the more experiential side of seeking the nature of the one. As the soul advances towards the formless, unable to grasp what is without contour, or to receive the imprint of reality as diffuse, it fears it will encounter nothingness, and it slips away. So we're reaching for what is beyond even being, what has no existence, so to speak. It has some mode of existence, as I talked about two weeks ago. It must, we can't say it's nothing because it's the cause of all, yet being the cause of existence, we can't technically say it exists. And so we're reaching, we're grasping for something that can't be grasped. And so it, the soul has the fear that it's encountering nothingness when it's trying to go beyond existence. So that's the first problem, if you will, that we hit. He's going to name a number of problems in this essay. And then here's another one, that when the soul seeks to know in its own way, by coalescence and unification, so he's already giving us a hint of where he's going here, of how to do this, that the soul, the first step here is through unification of the soul. And that's very much consistent with all the things that Plato have, was saying about educating the soul. Um, so when the soul seeks to know in its own way, by coalescence and unification, it is prevented by that very unification from recognizing that it has found the one, for it is unable to distinguish knower and known. But nonetheless, a philosophical study of the one must follow this course. So what we're seeking is that which is beyond that duality of knower and known. There has to be a certain sameness and actually the Greek for what we call the one itself would actually more literally be translated as the one self. Or also that word for self also means same in other contexts. And that actually fits very well with what Plotinus is doing here. And it also is quite consistent with, say, Hinduism and other wisdom traditions that talk of the self. Because there's a sameness between our soul and what we are seeking. And when there is no otherness, then we can say to have a full recognition or be fully in the presence of the one. And that is the um, experience that we're seeking. I use the word experience loosely because technically an experience means a knower and a known and we're going beyond that. So we have to use experience with air quotes in our minds. But that's what we're seeking. And so we can think of this as the one self. Um, I think a lot of academics are hesitant to use that translation because it sounds too spiritual, but it is consistent with what Plotinus is writing here. Okay, he also tells us in this section that the rise to the one comes in two stages. Here's the first stage. The soul must withdraw from sense objects, the lowest existence, and turn to those of the highest. It must free itself from all evil since it aspires to rise to the good. I'm going to pause for a moment because the word evil um, does have certain connotations in our modern cultures. Um, I've talked about this on some past videos, um, but for those of you who are new to my videos, I do want to repeat this and I'm going to add a little to what I have said in the past. Now, when Platonists use the word evil, it generally does not have that moral connotation 
that our Judeo-Christian mindsets give it. When we're talking about behaviors, those could be evil in the moral sense. Think of like the mass murders a tyrant may engage in. That could be described as evil in the way that we would talk about it. But when evil is used to describe the soul, it generally means a state of unhealthiness. Because for Platonists, that horrible behavior that people engage in is not rooted in in sin or in some kind of inherent sin that we're born with. It is rooted in ignorance. And so evil is used in the sense of unhealthy. If you read it that way, when it's talking about the soul, then it makes a lot more sense in the context it's used in. Now here, the word evil is being used in a metaphysical sense. And so I'm going to add another way of understanding this word. And I think it's very helpful in metaphysics to think of evil as a state of differentiation. Because for the Platonists, unification is equal to the good. Therefore, differentiation would be called evil in contrast. But it's, again, not evil in that moralistic sense, but it's evil in the sense of having um, progressed away from the one into greater differentiation. So he's saying here that the soul must free itself from all differentiation or multiplicity since it aspires to rise to the good. It must rise to the principle possessed within itself from the multiplicity that it was, it must again become one. Only thus can it contemplate the supreme principle, the one. So we have a two-step process, and this is the first one, is getting rid of all of the false beliefs that have us um, separated and broken up and our attention drawn this way and then that. We want to bring a complete unity to our soul. We're actually going even beyond what's... Um, what I've talked about in some past videos in terms of, um, of bringing unity to the soul. This is the, the highest sense of unity, to get rid of all sense of differentiation or multiplicity, and, and there'll be more about that as we go on. But that's the first step. Once you do that, the soul can participate in noose, or as this translator is calling it, the intelligence. So having become the intelligence, having entrusted itself to it, committed itself to it, having confided and established itself in it, so that by alert concentration, the soul may grasp all that the intelligence sees. It will, by the intelligence, contemplate the one, without employing the senses, without mingling perception with the activity of the intelligence. So noose is kind of like the taxi that is gonna, we're going to hitch a ride with to take us to that final journey to the one. So it's two steps. We bring unity to our soul, allowing us to participate in noose, and then through noose, we're able to make that jump, that leap to the one. He says that it must contemplate this purest of objects through the purest part of the intelligence, through the purest of the intelligence, through that which is supreme in the intelligence. And this, of course, is implying that the experience of noose admits of degrees. Now, also in this section, he reiterates something that we've seen in past Ennead as well. The idea that the one is the begetter, the first cause of all. And as begetter, the one is none of the things that it begets. So this was expressed in another Ennead as well. I gave you a quote two weeks ago that's very similar to this one, but I'll show you how he expresses it here in this essay. He says, as the one begets all things, it cannot be any of them, neither thing, nor quality, nor quantity, nor intelligence, nor soul. It's not in motion, nor at rest, not in space, nor in time. It is the in itself uniform, or rather it is the without form, preceding form, movement and rest, which are characteristics of being, and they make being multiple. Okay, so the one is none of the things that it creates. And what this means for us is that the goal of seeking the one requires rising above knowledge. He says, awareness of the one comes to us neither by knowing nor by the pure thought that discovers the other intelligible things, but rather it's by a presence transcending knowledge I really like this phrase, a presence transcending knowledge. 
I don't know to what degree it's um, credited to Plotinus and to what degree it's credited to the translator, but I do like that phrase, a presence transcending knowledge. It's a nice description. When the soul knows something, it loses its unity. It cannot remain simply one because knowledge implies discursive reason and discursive reason implies multiplicity. The soul then misses the one and it falls into number and multiplicity. Therefore, the goal that we're seeking requires us to go beyond knowledge and hold to unity. Now, if the soul does not feel a rapture within it, like that of the lover come to rest in his love, if because of his closeness to the one, he's able to receive its true light, his whole soul made luminous, but despite being this close, he's still weighted down and his vision frustrated. So this is a common problem. And I'll tell you, honestly, it's one I can relate to, um, that to be filled with this luminosity, but still falling short. And Plotinus tells us that if you rise alone, but still, if you do not rise alone, sorry, but you're still carrying with you something alien to the one. So you still have some false image. There's a, a self image. You have to get rid of the images of the self in order to be purely the self alone. And if there's still something alien to the one, then you have got no one to blame but yourself. And so what you need to do, he gives us some advice here, become pure by detaching yourself from everything. You must get rid of every image of self. You must be purely self in order to truly be in the presence of the self. Now the one is present only to those who are prepared for it and are able to receive it, to enter into harmony with it, to grasp and to touch it by virtue of their likeness to it by virtue of that inner power that is similar to and stemming from the one. Now he's going to take, it seems like a step back, but this is because noose is that launch pad from which we make that jump, the second step of our journey. So he's going to take another look at noose. The intelligence is different from our faculty of reasoning, the so-called rational principle, that reasoning implies, as it were, separate steps in movements. So in our colloquial language, we tend to call, to use the word intelligence to um, refer to like that logical reasoning that we go through, that goes through steps. But he's saying he's using it differently here. That's not what he's talking about. Now that faculty of reasoning, we can understand by looking at the divided line. And this is Plato's um, divided line from his Republic. This matches up to the allegory of the cave in Book 7 of the Republic. So that stage of discursive reasoning, of using logic, that would be very much like that prisoner who has, freed, who has become freed and in their journey out of the cave, they're going up a long, steep ascent. And that's very much like this idea of dianoia, or what here I'm calling understanding. So that person is focused on the upper world. That person can see the light coming through the opening of the cave, but cannot yet see the upper world, is not yet experiencing it directly. And so logic is needed and reasoning is needed to try to get some understanding of what is probably out there. But when the person is able to step out into the upper world, that is the realm of nous, and that's knowledge, that's noesis in, in Greek. And that's the sort of direct knowing that pure thought, as it was called elsewhere in this essay, or sometimes translated as pure reason. And so that's the distinction. So here's that same quote again, that the intelligence is different from our faculty of reasoning, that so-called rational principle, that level of dianoia. Because that reasoning implies, as it were, separate steps in movements. But knowledge, that fourth section of the divided line, that consists in the manifestation of the rational forms that exist in the soul. And they come to the soul from the intelligence, which is the source of knowledge. Now, by the way, some translators will call that fourth section of the divided line understanding, which really confuses things. I always use understanding to talk about 
that third section because that's where we are using logical discursive thought. Whereas, well, of course, there is understanding going on in the upper world. It's really marked by that knowledge, that pure thought that is um, the mark of news. Okay, the sixth section of this essay, then, he talks about the one as the via negativa, as that path to the one by looking at the negatives, what it's not. And let's see how he does this. He's going to take away everything we think we know about the one. He says it's not indivisible in the same sense in which the smallest is indivisible. On the contrary, the one is the greatest, not physically, but dynamically. Hence, it is indivisible, not physically, but dynamically. Now, technically, the via negativa should be saying it's neither indivisible nor not indivisible because it's beyond that dichotomy and so on for everything. But he is taking away the idea of division in it. And he's taking away the idea of it being something small. And he says the one is infinite, not as extension or a numerical series is infinite, but in, in its limitless power. So he's taking away the idea of anything finite or having any kind of limit to it. There must be something that is fully self-sufficient, and that is the one. It alone, within and without, is without need. It needs nothing outside itself either to exist, to achieve well-being, or to be sustained in existence. Okay, again, technically we'd say it's, it's neither self-sufficient nor not self-sufficient, but this idea of taking away need is what he's stressing here. Now, being, however, is deficient, and he says that deficient being is deficient precisely because it aspires to its principle. But if the one were to aspire to anything, it would evidently seek not to be the one, that is, it would aspire to that which destroys it. And that is because, as we saw a few weeks ago, that the one preserves through its unity, through that unity itself is what, is, what preserves a thing in its being. And so if you aspire to something that is not the one, then you're aspiring to something that is not that which preserves, which means it would destroy it. And so he's showing that it's not logical to think of the one as aspiring to anything. So the one is also not an intellective existence. If it were, it would constitute a duality. Neither should one suppose it to be in a state of ignorance on the ground that it does not know itself and does not think itself. So here we do have a good via negativa. It neither knows itself nor is ignorant of itself. And this is because ignorance presupposes a dual relationship. One does not know another. But the one in its aloneness can neither know nor be ignorant of anything. So now that he took all of that away, he's going to show us how we can use the via negativa as the path that we must follow. So when you're thinking about all these things that the one is not, he says the mind reels at this. There's nothing to hold on to. And if the mind reels at this, the one being none of the things that we mentioned, a start yet can be made from them to contemplate it. So he's telling us that the purpose of taking away all the things that it's not is this is our starting point because how do you possibly contemplate that which is beyond even being? Now, it's only a starting point because saying what it's not doesn't tell you what it is. Like if someone had no idea what music was, telling them that it neither has fur nor feathers doesn't really tell you anything about music. And in the same way, the via negativa doesn't really tell you what the one is. It's just the starting point of our contemplations. And he says that no one can concentrate one thing by thinking of some other thing. So he should not connect something else with the object he's thinking of if he wishes really to grasp it. That's why we have to take away all the things it's not. If you're focusing on those things that it's not, you're never going to really grasp the one. It is said that matter must be void of all qualities in order to be capable of receiving all forms. So must the soul, and for a stronger reason, 
be stripped of all forms if it would be filled and fired by the supreme without any hindrance from within itself. Having thus freed itself of all externals, the soul must turn totally inward, not allowing itself to be rested back towards the outer. It must forget everything, the subjective first and finally the objective. It must not even know that it is itself that is applying itself to contemplation of the one. So this goes beyond a lot of what we've seen talking about the virtues in bringing that certain unity to the soul. This level of unity is discussed in the Phaedo, and the two-step process also is consistent with the Phaedo as well. And I'll leave it at that. But um, Okay, so section 8. Here he's ready to talk about that proper motion of the soul, that circular motion that was talked about in dialogues such as the Timaeus. Self-knowledge reveals to the soul that its natural motion is, is not, if uninterrupted, in a straight line, but rather it's circular, as around some inner object about a center, the point to which it owes its origin. Now, if the soul knows this, it will move around the center from which it came. It will cling to it and commune with it, as indeed all souls should, but only divine souls do. And he goes on to say that that is the secret of their divinity. And I put it in yellow because that's key here. That's the secret of what we're trying to do, is moving around that center. For divinity consists in being attached to the center. One who withdraws far from it becomes ordinary, or maybe even an animal. And so again, that's the idea of evil. It's not in the moralistic sense. It's in the sense of becoming more differentiated, moving away from that center. Now, raising ourselves above the body, excuse me, by the part of us that is not submerged, we are, by our own center, attaching ourselves to the center of all. What separates bodiless beings from one another is not spatial distance, but their own differences and diversities. So, of course, when we're talking about metaphysics, we are beyond the realms of time and space, and so we're not talking about spatial difference but their own differences and diversities. When there is not distance between them, they are mutually present. And as the one does not contain any difference, it is always present, and we are present to it when we no longer contain difference. Okay, now he's going to talk a little bit more about that goal of turning towards the one and why it's meaningful. As we turn towards the one, We exist to a higher degree, while to withdraw from it is to fall. And perhaps I should mention just briefly here that this fall, of course, is not like the fall of Adam and Eve due to original sin. It is the fall of moving into differentiation away from that center. And so when we are focused on the one, when we turn towards the one, we exist to a higher degree. Our state of mind is healthier. Our soul is healthier. That's the goal. We're not just talking about metaphysics. We're actually doing it. That's doing philosophy. The soul filled with divinity is pregnant. This is its starting point and its goal. It is its starting point because it is from the world above that it proceeds. It is its goal because in the world above, the good to which it aspires, I'm sorry, in the world above is the good to which it aspires. And by returning to the good, there, its proper nature is regained. So again, that is our goal, not just to talk about metaphysics, but to actually do this and to fulfill our destiny to be as healthy as we can be as souls. Further proof that our good is in the realm above is the love innate in our souls. Hence the coupling in picture and story of Eros with Psyche. So Psyche, of course, is the Greek word for soul, And the soul is different from the divinity eros, which means love. But according to Plotinus, psyche springs from the god love and therefore needs love. He says only in the world beyond does the real object of our love exist. The only one with which we can unite ourselves, of which we can have a part, and which we can intimately possess without being separated by the barriers of flesh. 
very much consistent with Plato and also with other wisdom traditions that talk about love in our physical world as being an image of our true love. Like in the symposium where we see the various um, ladder of beautiful things leading up to beauty itself. Now, we've seen the difficulties of uniting with the one, um, the difficulties of tearing away all that is false. But then there's another problem. Say you are fortunate enough to actually be in the presence of the one, to go beyond even that feeling of being filled with luminosity, to truly unite to the one. The next difficulty is, how do you stay there? And he asks, why does a soul that has risen to the realm above not stay there? Because it has not yet entirely detached itself from things here below. Yet a time will come when it will uninterruptedly have vision, when it will no longer be bothered by body. Now, there are two ways to understand this particular quote here. And I'm going to leave it open-ended because it's a question that I think is important to hold on to and is worth holding on to, to ask yourself, to what degree can we um, hold on to this vision while still in a body? So there's two ways to understand this. Is he saying that there will come a time when we no longer reincarnate, when we leave this life, a certain lifetime, and then do not reincarnate and are able to uninterruptedly have vision because we're no longer bothered with having a body anymore. That's one way to read it. But then we also have to ask ourselves, is it possible to hold on to this vision uninterruptedly while still in a body, to reach a state of mind that is so strong that the body no longer is a hindrance to us, that we can function in the physical world while holding on to this vision and not being bothered by the fact that we're still in a body. Those two ways of reading it are both possible. So we have to ask ourselves which one fits reality, which one fits our actual experience. Um, What is the degree to which we can hold on to vision while still in this lifetime? And so it's a question that we're likely to keep coming back to over and over and changing our answer to, and that's exactly what we should be doing. So I'm not going to say any more about it. I'm just going to leave you with that question. Now, the person who obtains the vision becomes, as it were, another being. He ceases to be himself, retains nothing of himself. Absorbed in the beyond, he is one with it, like a center, coincidence with another center. So here, of course, saying that he retains nothing of himself means nothing of the ego self, nothing of his self-image. And again, this really um, is clarified with the translation of the one itself as the one self. We want to clear away all the images of self so we can be purely the self and be absorbed into that, like a center coincident with another center, the self of our soul completely absorbed into the self itself, (laughs) if you will. So that's what he's talking about here. Okay, so now we've had this experience. We finally were able to be in that presence that transcends knowledge. Um, We hold on to it, but when we come out of that experience, can we remember it? Because obviously it would be a real shame to forget it. The vision, in any case, did not imply duality. The person who saw was identical with what he saw. Hence, he did not see it, but rather he was one with it. So again, you become self in order to be in that presence, which means that if you could preserve the memory of what you were when you were self, when you were thus absorbed in the one, then you would possess within yourself an image of what it was. Now, when he has made his ascent, there was within him No disturbance, no anger, emotion, desire, reason, or thought. He was in utter rest, having, so to say, become rest itself. In this state, he busied himself no longer even with the beautiful, even with the experience of the intelligible, which is often called beauty itself. 
He had risen above beauty, had passed beyond even the choir of virtues. Such an experience is hardly a vision. It is a seeing of a quite different kind, a self-transcendence, a simplification, self-abandonment, a striving for union and a repose, an intentness upon confirmation. This is the way one sees in the sanctuary. Anyone who tries to see in any other way will see nothing. One who has not yet arrived there will leave aside nothing of the divine that the soul is capable of acquiring. And if his vision is not yet complete, he will attend to its completion, which for him who is risen above all is the one that is above all. Again, that's doing philosophy rather than just talking about it. Now, if you look upon yourself in this state, in this exalted state, you will find yourself an image of the one. And if you rise beyond yourself, an image rising to its model, you have reached the goal of your journey. So again, another way of stating the two stages of our journey. And when you fall from this vision, you will, by arousing the virtue that is within yourself and by remembering the perfection that you possess, regain your likeness and through virtue rise to the intelligence and through wisdom that second stage of the journey you'll rise to the one okay so that's all you got to do it's easy no not really but um i do hope that you enjoyed that and if you did i would appreciate you hitting the like button just takes a second and also if you have any questions or comments or any requests for future videos please leave them below in the comment section Thank you very much.